Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining us on this latest Innovation at Work uh, uh, webinar. This is uh, one of our now uh, increased frequency weekly uh, webinars, uh, helping all of us, we hope, uh, to, with some uh, questions and issues that we're uh, facing in light of the current health crisis that has spread all around the world. Uh, this is a challenging time uh, in many ways for all of us, so we're really grateful and fortunate that Tara uh, has joined us. Dr. Tara Swart is both uh, an MD and a neuroscientist who teaches in our exec ed programs uh, at the Sloan School uh, and really has a wide range of expertise that's very relevant to the challenges that we're facing. But today we've asked Tara to really in particular focus on the question of, uh, of resilience uh, and how what everything that uh, she knows and teaches and uh, helps executives that she works with uh, can be brought to bear uh, to really focus on uh, questions like how do we navigate the brain's response uh, to these unprecedented levels of uncertainty that we're facing? What's the role of neuroplasticity, uh, particularly in uh, challenging times like these? Uh, and how uh, can we maintain uh, our mental agility? Uh, and so, uh, as uh, Keith mentioned, we'll have some time for some a few questions uh, right at the end, but I will hand over uh, the reins to Tara right now uh, so that she can uh, tell us uh, her thoughts about this topic. Tara, over to you. Thank you, Peter. And um, I really want to say quite a personal hello to everyone. I'm absolutely blown away by the number of people who've registered for this. And as I can see, the number of people that are on here live at this time. And we know that you're from all over the world. So it just, it means so much to us to be able to do something to help at such a difficult time. Um, I know that there are some people in the audience who have met me on campus. So I can't see you, but I know that you're there. And so a special hello to all of you as well. Um, as many of you know, mental resilience has long been my primary area of research. So as you can imagine, this is something that's so needed right now. And even though I've been researching it for a long time, it suddenly, it feels so different to have to apply it in this absolutely surreal paradigm. So um, I wanted to start off by actually bringing up a very old piece of psychology research. It's a 1960s model of what happens in our brains and our minds after we go through a really intense period of change or grief. And so I think this is more relevant now than it has ever been since the 1960s. I've definitely experienced some of this curve myself already. I've actually been in isolation for seven weeks um, and I'm hearing more and more people, friends, clients, um, students, saying that, you know, articulating being at some of these stages, but not really understanding why they're going through these feelings and what they can do about them. So the most important thing to say is that we will all go through this curve that our loved ones and team members will go through the curve at a different rate to us and that can cause a lot of conflict and frustration. So understanding that is important. And unfortunately, in such a, a global and ongoing situation, it's likely that each of us will go through this curve several times. So at first, you know, the whole thing may have been shocking. We may have gone through a feeling of, well, it won't happen to me, or it's not as bad as they're saying it is, and it's the media making it sound worse. Um, then there'll be all the things that we have to do that we don't want to do that are quite frustrating and confining. And then there really is an appearance. And so what, what I'm seeing is that people's serotonin levels, the mood hormone levels are actually becoming so low that they're bec becoming lower than the normal range. And at this time it can feel like there's no light at the end of the tunnel and you're just going to be depressed forever or until this ends. And it's really important to know that you have to allow your brain to process that depression to be able to come out of the other end of the curve and think, okay, what could I do differently? Uh, how can I find some meaning or purpose in this situation? And eventually to be able to accept that things have changed or things are as they are. 
But like I said, be mindful that if you if you feel that you've gone through this once already, which I don't think any of us have completely yet, that it's possible that there'll be another shock and another um, journey through the curve. So I do feel that this model is really helpful if you're experiencing those feelings of frustration or depression to understand that it's a journey that we have to go through. So what I'd really like you all to do um, now for 30 seconds, 45 seconds is to just actually write down for yourself how you are feeling physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So in this situation, in isolation, in lockdown, how are you feeling in your body? How has your thinking changed to prior to lockdown or isolation? What sorts of emotions are you experiencing or have you experienced in the last few weeks? And how is this feeling in your spirit and in your integrity and in your values? So in my home, we do a daily check-in of each other. How are you feeling physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? And it's just a really good way of helping you to understand where you are on that curve and, and understand where the people that you're close to, where they might be if it's not the same as where you are. And so I, I would like you to keep thinking about this and writing it down. It's quite important to get it out of your brain, not just have it going round and round in your brain. But you know what I'm hearing from a lot of people is that physically I feel very confined. I'm not moving around as much as I normally do. I'm even hearing from clients and patients more cases of constipation because every, everything's slowed down. You're not moving. Your body's starting to slow down. It's part of that depression phase. Mentally, it can be mirrored by a slowing in your thoughts. It can feel like even though you might not be working as much as you were before or working in a very different way that you can't keep up mentally. It's really important to be able to articulate our emotions around this. And what I'm seeing again is that people feel fine, say that they're fine, but it doesn't take much to make you snap. So it can be a very little thing that you go from being absolutely calm, even quite positive and grateful, to just getting very upset or angry about something. And spiritually, you know, people are just, they're feeling crushed, they're feeling confined, and the uncertainty is just a very deep gripping fear. So um, make sure that you've written down what's personal for you in those four areas and try to do this check-in um, at least once a day. So another thing that's really interesting is about entrenched neural pathways. So this is kind of the opposite of neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is the fact that we have pathways developed in our brain from childhood, from the things that we've learned, from the things that we get exposed to. Um, but those things are very dynamic. We can learn new things. We can change the way that we think. We can uh, spend time with people who think differently and learn new ways of being. However, under chronic stress, which inevitably we're all under at the moment, our most entrenched ways of thinking and behaving come to the fore. And these tend to be things from the way we were brought up in our families as children. And so another really helpful way to look at what might be driving your neural pathways now is to think back to the pathways that were instilled in your brain from a really young age. So in terms of values, in terms of what's morally, in, eth ethically, and you know, integrally the most important things for you to uphold, how is that driving the way that you're behaving now? In terms of the roles that you may have played or may be playing now that doesn't, is not in keeping with your neural pathways, like being a carer, being a shielder of somebody who's vulnerable, of be being somebody who now who's maybe has ideas about what that means about you as a person somebody who is either now not working or working from home or um, working in a different way that changes your work identity which is a hugely important part of who we are what were the secrets that were kept in your family that they inevitably drive us to want to talk about or not talk about certain things so you know something again that i'm seeing is the people who are willing to talk about their emotions in this situation and versus the people who aren't 
in boundaries is a really interesting one because we're kind of all in the situation where whatever our boundaries are, something much more restrictive has been imposed upon that. So whether you're somebody who, you know, always has people dropping into your house or whether you're quite a private person, our boundaries have now been transgressed, at least psychologically, if not physically. And so how you might be responding to that is really interesting to think about. The most common things I hear people saying is that if you have any sort of OCD tendencies where you like things to be very neat and orderly or you like to be in control, a huge issue for many people right now, then we're seeing the OCD type of behavior coming out more and more, an insistence on things being neat, tidy, lined up, orderly, and a huge feeling of stress if that's not the case in the home. Now add in kids at home on school holidays, add in homeschooling, and you can see how that can become quite overwhelming for the brain. Who did you identify with as a child or who do you identify with now? So you know, we're looking to our leadership to give us direction. We may find that we strongly do or don't identify with the people who are supposed to be protecting us now. Um, we may be harking back to the way that our father behaved or the way that we behaved as a child and um, may, that may be resonating with us at the moment. So another really interesting thing that's happening is that as a global community, we're experiencing much more vivid dreaming. And this was reported during the two world wars and during the, the ensuing Holocaust. Um, so we think we know that it's a way of psychological processing. Some people are finding it very frightening because the dreams tend to be anxiety dreams, which is understandable at the moment. But just remember that curve that we're all working through and know that dreaming or vivid dreaming is a way of you filing away all of these emotions and these entrenched neural deep primal behaviors that maybe it's difficult to articulate on the surface. Expectations is another really big one that people are really struggling with. So there's a certain expectation around when will our children go back to school? Will I be able to have my summer vacation? When will I be able to return to campus at MIT? And expectations around being protected and having the kind of food that you might want to eat. Um, all of that is being massively challenged now. And so in that first part of the curve, before we get to depression, the shock, anger, denial part of the curve, we're all experiencing elevated levels of the stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. Now, they are very useful short term responses to stress, but isolation has gone on for several weeks in most countries now. Um, so understanding what's going on for you physically when you're under chronic stress is, is really important as well. So this is an interesting one. I, I did a IGTV over Easter weekend saying that people should not feel pressure to learn a new language or build their brand under these kind of conditions. And there is a bit of that kind of talk going around. And I know that JK Rowling has said that life coaches who are telling people to, you know, come up with new skills and um, reinvent themselves should stop shaming people. So what I really think is important here is mastery over the small things that you can control that will actually help you to navigate this unprecedented stress and change better, rather than feeling like you should be becoming an expert at a, you know, dusting off your guitar or, or at a certain sport. The way that I like to view mastery in terms of the brain is to think of your brain as your dream home. Now, at the moment, we're in, we've been given an opportunity in a way to embed those micro habits. Um, and let's keep it really simple. At the moment, given that there's less routine and structure in our lives and that we are doing this vivid dreaming, um, we need to be sleeping, not just what I usually say, which is seven to nine hours of good quality sleep. We need to be going to bed and waking up at the same time every day. Now, we tend to do this when we have a commute and a job to go to, um, and that's not so needed now. So it's a way of getting sleep that's better for your brain with consistent sleep and wake times, but also adding in some routine and structure to your day. 
It might be difficult to get the nutrition dense diet that we recommend, but you can um, make good food choices and use some forms of supplementation to try to improve your brain health during this period. Movement, it may be easy to be stuck indoors, only go out once a day, and you may not be getting the five to 10,000 steps that you, you, you know, would like to normally be getting. So finding a way of incorporating that into your normal routine is really important. And finally, um, simplicity, which is mostly about reducing choices, which has kind of artificially been done for us at the moment, but it's also about mindfulness. The way to look at this is that if you, ha if you had this beautiful home, you would keep it clean. You wouldn't let strangers walk into it and drag mud all over the carpets. You'd look after the houseplants. You'd only have beautiful furniture in it. This is the time to try to do that with your brain. So we know that if you make time for some sort of mindfulness, which is just the most vital thing at the moment to deal with all this stress. So whether it's meditation, whether it's yoga, whether it's going for a mindful walk and looking at a leaf really, really up close in detail for a minute, and then looking at a big tree far away in the distance, that's very relaxing for your brain to give it that different perspective. Whether it's mindful eating, whether it's paying attention to the people who you are confined with, all of those things reduce your cortisol levels, your stress levels, put your brain into a gamma wave state, which is neither switched on and task focused nor asleep, and have been shown that if you include those sorts of activities, not just sitting down and meditating in your life, that you actually build up your mental resilience over an eight week period. If, or if not all of those are activities are for you, another thing you can do is cold showering. So ideally you would do a cold shower to shock your body into stress, and then you would warm up in a sauna afterwards. Now most of us don't have access to a sauna in our home. So, I've just been doing cold showers. There's a study from Finland that shows 15, 30 or 60 second cold showers improve your resilience to certain bacteria and viruses. So they, they showed that people who did that got less colds and flus in the winter and the people who did get colds and flus that were doing cold showering had a lower um, number of days that the cold and flu lasted for. So I've written in my book and I speak in class about six ways of thinking and I slightly moder mo moderated them um, for the situation that we're in now. So it's really important to be able to regulate your emotions. It's totally understandable that you might completely shut down and repress your emotions or that you might get quite angry and irritable. Um, so mindfulness activities throughout the day are the best way of starting to regulate those extremes. Remembering very much about how mental resilience and physical resilience are connected. If you're physically tired, it's going to be harder to regulate your emotions and make good food choices. If you're very, very stressed, which we probably are anyway, then it's going to erode your immunity. And so that's you know, exactly what we need to be taking care of. And just remembering that connection, that's what mindfulness is, helps to boost your immunity and to improve your resilience to withstand the difficulties that we might have to go through. I normally talk about intuition here, but I would say that this is a time where it might be harder to rely on that. And actually the best thing that you could be doing now for your gut health and for your mental health is to be taking a good quality probiotic, especially ones that contain the, stra the strains that are known to contribute to good mental health. So it's been shown in studies that if you take a psychobiotic for one month, it actually reduces negative thinking and anxiety. I talked about embedding micro habits around sleep, diet, exercise, um, and mindfulness. And actually understanding that motivation and resilience aren't things that I have or you have or somebody else doesn't. They're things that you can. you're learning about yourself from the situation that we're all in. So I've made a slide here of, of ideas for things that you can actually do to improve um, or on all six of those brain pathways that correlate to different ways that we think. So gratitude lists, I mean, literally just write down 10 things you're grateful for. 
Try to include things that are intrinsic qualities about yourself, like your resilience or your creativity or your vulnerability. And then also try to include things about what you're seeing in the outside world. It kind of helps to build up your own self-confidence and resilience, but also to connect to what's happening outside and understand that those things are connected. It leads to be able to think more positively, even if we're consistently being bombarded with bad news. We know, for example, that people that repeatedly looked at images of the Twin Towers falling during 9-11 were more likely to get PTSD than people who didn't, regardless of whether you were personally involved in that situation. So curate how much news you're looking at and what kind of news you're looking at. If you have a recurring anxiety or negative thought process, create an uh, affirmation for yourself that's the opposite of that belief. If you're really struggling with your emotions or you have no one that you can talk to, write everything down in a journal. It will help you track how you're doing through that curve and help you to understand that and not feel so um, stressed by feelings that you can't understand. Try out some visualizations, some, use a meditation app and do a body scan to connect your brain and body. So just work through your body, understanding where you've got stress or tension um, and just make that connection stronger. So just in recap, um, the meditation apps I really recommend are Headspace, Calm and Buddhify. There are lots of good classes online for you to be able to get your activity, but yoga, if you're not familiar with it, is a really good one to do online. Try the cold showering. I've been doing it for a couple of weeks now. It's not as bad as you think it's going to be. Try to do something each day that really brings to the fore your connection to one of your senses, whether it's savoring your cup of tea, whether it's feeling a certain texture of soft furnishings that you have in your house, whether it's using aromatherapy oils. I write in my book, The Source, about universal connection. And I think it's so interesting that this vivid dreaming is becoming such a phenomenon. Um, because in Aboriginal communities, they speak about the dreaming, which is the story of creation. And it's their understanding of the interconnectedness of everything and every person. So the strange thing about the situation we're in is that none of us are in it alone. It doesn't matter where in the world you are, what kind of house you've got or life you live, we're all in the same situation. Um, and that can be helpful in terms of doing like Zoom dinner parties, or it can be helpful in terms of doing group meditations. Okay, so I really wanted to leave some time for questions. So Peter, please, can you let me know if there are any? Uh, thank you very much, Tara. This, as always, was fascinating, and we've been having many questions coming in. Perhaps just uh, very quickly, there was one definitional one that came through from a few people, which was, could you say a bit more for people who perhaps haven't had a chance to read the book yet about the difference between mental and emotional uh, states when you're using those terms? Yeah, sorry, I rushed through that one a bit because I know that lots of people have been in my class. Um, basically, mental is about your thoughts. So it's about both what's in your thoughts. So, you know, is it very negative, depressing thoughts? But it's also about the sort of quality of your thoughts. Like, are you having a lot of thoughts or are you not able to have a lot of thoughts? Um, and emotions is about um, your emotional feelings. So things like, are you feeling fearful, angry, sad, um, happy, grateful? So, um, I mean, you know, I have this model of basic human emotions, but, or, but any of those emotional words, like how are you feeling compared to what you're thinking and the quality of your thinking? Great, thank you, that's, that's super helpful. Um, you talked a bit in the, uh, today, perhaps you could expand a bit more on uh, this idea of brain-body uh, connection. Uh, and, you know, is it really true or how much does mental state uh, affect the body and show up in the body and, uh, and vice versa? Can you give, just give a quick example of that? Yeah, so it, um, it's truer than ever, I think, at the moment where we're experiencing stress it's it's mostly mental stress but we are also physically confined maybe not eating in the way that we normally do and all it's a very much if you're feeling stressed if you're feeling grateful if you're feeling irritable any of those sorts of mental or emotional things they have an effect on the nerves and hormones in your body so they will either produce a stress response or a relaxation response. 
But like I said, it's a two way thing. So if you've been sleeping really well and you have been going outside and getting some fresh air and some exercise, then it's actually less likely that you're going to go into a spiral of negative thinking or that you'll become withdrawn and, you know, stop communicating with your friends and sort of just do the minimum at work. So it's really important to understand how interrelated those two things are, because sometimes you can use one to boost the other one. So you can use a positive affirmation to get yourself out exercising again, or you can use, you know, your posture or some deep breaths to get your brain, you know, functioning well again. Oh, thank you. That's interesting. And that sort of segues actually into another set of questions, which uh, are, I think people are fascinated by this idea of on the one hand, you're advocating neuroplasticity, and that seems mm -hmm. to have to do with sort of potentially learning new things and adaption. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you were saying not taken to the extreme of trying to totally master new things. So, you know, what's the best way that uh, we could all be uh, engaging in sort of these neuroplasticity enhancing activities that uh, are, are, are positive and don't fall into some of those traps that you're worried about? Yeah, I mean, at the best of times, I always say that if you're, if you're traveling a lot or you're up against a deadline, it's not the time to, you know, redecorate your house or learn a new language. But when you have some bandwidth, I encourage people to do something once a year to try to really improve their neuroplasticity. Um, so quite early on, I realized that it was important to say that, you know, because it was kind of going around a bit that this is your opportunity to learn a new language or do, you know, do all the, make your new website. That it, only took, it was only a matter of weeks before people really didn't feel able to do that as well as everything else that they've got to do. So I, I'm being very practical about it. A lot of us are now having to homeschool or do all of the housework and, you know, come up with three interesting meals a day. So I would focus on things like <clears throat> cooking, um, reading, sort of, you know, things that are still stimulating for your brain, but aren't too demanding. Because at the moment, we're basically in survival mode, um, which means that blood flow isn't even going to the parts of the brain um, that, that carry out some of the higher functions and, and won't be released to connecting up new neurons or creating new neurons. So keep it simple. Um, crosswords, you know, normally I say crosswords aren't enough for neuroplasticity, but right now, crosswords mm -hmm. are fine. Great, thank you. I think we, we take the point and we appreciate, uh, I think all of us, the, uh, the, fle the flexibility that you're advocating for us here as well. I think that we all agree that's, that's important. And I'm afraid we're without a time, we're still well over a hundred questions still to answer. So as <laughs> Keith uh, promised, we will uh, share those with Tara offline uh, and, and uh, provide some more information on the blog. Tara, did you have some uh, uh, other reading recommendations on a slide oh, yes. as well? Just to um, leave those I didn't screen. make this slide, by the way. Okay. <laughs> this slide was given to me. But um, actually, really gratifyingly, a lot of people have said they are rereading the source. And the source is about mental resilience. So I, I do actually really recommend it for now. Um, and obviously, there's my previous book, Neuroscience for Leadership, as well. Um, and... Yeah, so there's lots of information on the website, lots of podcasts, lots of blogs, um, you know, shorter things to read. And both um, MIT, Sloan and Executive Education and myself are very um, active on Twitter and Instagram with lots of resilience tips. Um, and mostly just to say, like, I just can't believe how many people we had who've like stayed all this time. So thank you so much. Yes, that's, that's great. Uh, thank you to all of you. I think we had... Uh, I saw as many as 1,700 people listening in uh, live and many more who, of course, will watch the recording. Thank you to you all. Thank you, Tara, uh, for once again, both a fascinating and a useful uh, session here with us. Uh, and with that, it just remains for me to say goodbye. And I think we're all going to go off now and have a cold shower. <laughs>